Yes, hi. Um, as was just said, I'm Justin Phillips. I'm in Hartmut Hefter's group at um, UC Berkeley. Uh, and yeah, I'll be talking about this um, experiment that we are beginning to get underway. Uh, so first, I want to give you guys a quick introduction to the field of quantum information science. So this field is frequently subdivided into these three main categories. Um, you've got quantum communication, which includes applications like ultra-high security communication. Um, quantum sensing and metrology. So how can we use the quantum uh, properties of particles in order to uh, do better, better measurements, maybe more precise measurements? And quantum computing, um, which is a huge field uh, looking to use the, the properties of quantum particles uh, in order to achieve more efficient or faster algorithms uh, for certain classifications of problem. And all of these subfields, uh, Either, either rely on or benefit substantially from specifically the, the quantum uh, property known as entanglement. Um, so quantum entanglement, for, if anybody is, is not familiar, is uh, sort of a specific distinction between the way classical and, and uh, quantum particles behave. So if you have a classical system, um, you might think of it as having two bits, um, and each one is defined well as either zero or one, and you can always describe the composite system as uh, you know, bit one is, is A, bit two is B, and, and that's cut and dry. But if you have a quantum system, you might think, well, there's some wave function describing um, both pieces of my system. I should be able to write the total system uh, as if the first bit is in this wave function and the second one is in this wave function. Uh, and it turns out that that's not always true. And specifically, if it's not true, it means that the states are entangled uh, and they share some sort of special, uh, more than classical correlation. Um, and also that correlation uh, persists over arbitrarily long distances. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is a, a plan for us to build an experimental um, quantum internet uh, between LBNL and uh, the campus down at UC Berkeley. So in order to do that, I should probably define what I mean by quantum internet. Uh, so if you have um, two nodes, which are quantum quantum nodes, quantum particles, uh, one at one location and one at another, uh, and you're able to send information between them using some sort of a traveling qubit, um, that constitutes what I mean for the simplest quantum internet that you can imagine. Uh, so we're going to choose to build a system like this where the nodes are trapped calcium-40 ions, um, meaning single atoms which are, are held in place, um, and we're able to address them with, with lasers. Um, and those atoms emit photons, and we're going to collect those photons and send them back and forth between uh, UC Berkeley and LBNL. Uh, and the reason that we, we choose trapped calcium ions over other options like superconducting qubits or color centers is because they have very long coherence times, meaning when you put quantum information in them, they hold them for a long time, um, seconds or, or longer. Um, and that's, that's a long time on the scale that we're talking about. Uh, and, and also you can, with high fidelity, meaning with high reproducibility, you can put them in a specific quantum state. Uh, and then photons are the natural choice for a traveling qubit because they're fast. Um, the speed of light is pretty fast. So <laughs> that's what we're, we're going to choose to use for our traveling qubit. Um, so here's a bird's eye view of um, what our real, our real plan is here. So um, it says 10 kilometers on the screen, and the reason that it says that is because that's the total distance of fiber that's been laid. But my piece of the experiment is going to focus on a five kilometer stretch of telecom band optical fiber, which connects the uh, UC Berkeley's trapped ion node to LVNL's trapped ion node. Uh, and we're also going to interface eventually with a color center qubit, which is being worked on by uh, the Sibuhigo and Schenkel groups um, at UC Berkeley. Uh, my contingent is the trapped ion group. I work with Hartmut Hefner and Tracy Northup, um, a collaborator from Innsbruck. And then we also have a quantum frequency conversion team, which I'll mention uh, why later, at Caltech. And um, Lavanya uh, Ramakrishnan, I think, is here um, and will be uh, heading a network control management team, which is uh, focusing on coordinating all of the timing that needs to happen in order for, for these sorts of things to work out. So. Um, let me just real quickly step through, how, how do you do this? So in order to have this quantum internet, we, we need a trapped ion at UC Berkeley to be entangled with one at LBNL. Um, and we need to be able to generate that entanglement quickly and with high fidelity. 
Uh, so we might imagine what we're looking at here is an energy level scheme for the calcium ion. There's some excited energy level E and two spin up and spin down um, ground states. Uh, so that energy, uh, or, or sorry, that electron, valence electron, might decay to either one of those ground states. And because of an angular momentum difference in the two ground states, the state of the photon that comes out, the polarization of the photon, depends on which decay path is chosen um, by the atom. So we get two different states. Either the atom is up and the, the uh, photon is horizontally polarized, or the atom is down and the photon is vertically polarized. And uh, if we are able to erase the information about uh, which path it took, then we can actually prepare this entangled state between an atom and a photon, where the, the spin state of the atom is entangled with the polarization of the photon. And I'm not going to go uh, step through this now. If you would like me to later, I'm happy to take questions about it, either at the break or, um, or right after. But it actually turns out to be the case that if you make a clever series of measurements on the photons that were emitted from two different ion nodes, um, you can do what's called project the atoms into an entangled state, where you swap the entanglement from the photons onto the atoms. And so that's the scheme that we're going to choose to use. Uh, and, and doing that, we should be able to prepare an entangled state between um, UC Berkeley's atom and the one at LBNL. Um, but you know, this is all really easy to say that we're going to do, but doing it is going to be hard. Um, and the reasons are that it's going to be harder than what's already been accomplished um, by other groups is mostly because we want to use a fiber link that is long. Um, and when you transmit photons through fibers, you're going to lose photons in the fiber. The, the transmission is not 100%, and it scales with the distance. Um, so in order to have even a somewhat reasonable loss rate in the fiber of 0.2 dB per kilometer, roughly, we need to be operating in the telecom band. Um, but the telecom band is like 1,550 nanometers. That's a much higher wavelength than where our calcium atom naturally emits. So we need to also... Uh, use a quantum frequency conversion technique in order to uh, retain the quantum information in our photons, um, but convert the frequency up to telecom band, uh, down to telecom band. Uh, and in order to get high rate, high fidelity entanglement, um, which we want for fast and efficient communication algorithms um, or pr pr protocols, we're going to need to, you know, uh, really try to mitigate these losses. So it starts with an atom. The atom is emitting photons in general in any direction. It emits isotropically. And the way that this has generally been, uh, th these types of experiments have been done is to have a lens that's really close to the atom, as close as you can put it to the atom without interfering with it. And you're going to be able to collect something like 10% of the photons that are emitted that way. Um, so we're then going to do a quantum frequency conversion technique, lose another 75%. Uh, then in the fiber, uh, we're going to lose 20% or so after losing a dB over um, 5 kilometers. And we're going to have a detector that's not 100% efficient. And then we're going to have to do that, uh, uh, or sorry, after that, that's going to be only about 2% of our emitted photons in the first place um, that, that we're able to hang on to. Um, and then we have to do that two times because we have two nodes. Um, so then you've got to square it, and you're down to something like 0.04% um, of your photons, you know, that's a problem. Um, but we're going to focus on uh, trying to increase that number specifically by doing something about this um, lens here. We're going to replace that free space collection lens with what's called an optical cavity, meaning we're going to put two highly reflective mirrors right around the atom. Um, and there's actually some really interesting physics here where the atom is encouraged to, to what's called emit into the cavity mode, meaning the atom is much more likely to uh, when it emits photons, the, the, the spherical symmetry of the geometry has been broken by the mirrors, and um, the atom is now going to, to prefer to emit photons towards the mirrors in a way that they'll bounce back and forth between them. And if the mirrors are super reflective, this is a much stronger effect. Then we're going to put a lens behind one of the mirrors, and photons that leak through the mirror um, will be collected by the lens. And with that collection technique, we expect to be able to increase the 10% collection efficiency um, to something much higher, maybe as high as uh, 70%. And that will make our eta squared um, a lot closer to 2%, which is you know, uh, much higher. So um, what do we actually have to do? Well, we're going to engineer a pair of trapped ion nodes specifically designed for uh, establishing this long distance 
high rate, high fidelity entanglement between two ions. Um, so the current status of our experiment um, is really that there isn't an experiment yet, um, at least not physically. So we're in the planning stage. Um, this project is relatively young, and uh, we have a lot of hardware arriving in the next two months, which is going to let us get started uh, on building. And we're also renovating a lab space here at LBNL um, for us to start working on the, the trapped ion node that's supposed to live up the hill. Um, so what you see on the left here is a CAD design of what is going to be inside of our vacuum chamber. So when you build a trapped ion experiment, um, you, you don't want that ion uh, interacting with anything else that, that isn't the light that you intend for it to be interacting with. And so um, you do this inside an ultra high vacuum chamber. Um, and we need to design a way to put an ion trap, which is what you see on the right here, this little prism thing, um, in between two highly reflective mirrors and be able to align the atom to the cavity node or, or, or really anti-node. Um, so what that, what that picture is, is a, a um, prototype um, for what's going to be a piece of glass, which has uh, sort of uh, etched into it. It has these electrodes, those are those swiggly lines, and then it's going to be coated with a metal. Um, and we're going to use a combination of static and radio frequency electric fields to confine the ion um, right where this arrow is pointing. And then what you see going in between the mirrors there is uh, sort of this thing here, is um, the waste of our cavity mode. Um, and so we're going to have to align the ion very closely to that cavity mode, and that's in general not easy to do. Um, so it's going to be a really fun journey. There's a lot of challenges ahead for us, but um, yeah, we're, we're hopeful and optimistic um, to be able to establish a long distance quantum internet uh, between LBNL and UC Berkeley. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. That's very exciting. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Super cool talk. Um, so it seems like the distance adds a lot of challenges to the problems here, and you're coming up with all these super cool techniques to overcome that. Do you think that once you accomplish this, that those techniques can be used in like chiplet designs and quantum computers where the distance is very, very small, but uh, a similar problem, or is it a, a very different problem? Um, so the truth is that I'm not super educated on, <laughs> on those types of uh, architectures, but uh, I, I think that a lot of the biggest challenges that we're dealing with are the, um, that are new um, for our experiment have to do with the fact that we want to operate in a regime where the photon frequency is different from what the atom naturally communicates in. Um, and also that uh, something I didn't even mention during the talk is that the, the laser systems um, which are physically different laser systems at UC Berkeley and at LBNL, need to be very closely matched in absolute frequency in order to create what's known as indistinguishable photons. Otherwise, the projective measurement I mentioned, I mentioned won't work. So those are the biggest challenges, and I don't really think those are mappable to, the, to what you're talking about. But I also could be wrong because I, uh, it's not my area of... Um, yeah. yeah. Any other questions for Justin? Uh, may I ask what what type of um, frequency conversion scheme you plan to use? Yeah, so um, this is sort of the uh, area of expertise of our collaborators at Caltech, but um, I believe what they're trying to use is a frequency difference generation process with a, some sort of a nonlinear crystal. Thank you. Yeah. Any final question? If not, let's thank the speaker again.